Finishing up with brain anatomy now, here you see medulla oblongata. Um, this is a better slide for the olives and the pyramids. So you can see in the lower right there, pyramids and olives. Remember, pyramids again are where the decussation of the pyramids takes place. You can see in the uh, diagram uh, illustration to the left, um, the uh, motor descending motor tracks are crossing over, which makes that area extra wide. That's why they're raised up like that. And there you can see the olives. They look like olives. They're olive shaped. That's how they got their name. It's one of those things where, damn, look like olives. Yeah, all right, let's call them that. Okay, so here, look at the monkey face in the lower right. See the monkey face? See the big eyes and then the nose? I mean, then not really a mouth. I don't know. You think of it however you want to. And then notice the monkey has eyebrows. All right, see the eyebrows on the monkey? Notice then in the upper left, it's the same thing. It's just the monkey's upside down. All right, so we're looking from the opposite uh, perspective. So what's going on here? So see the hole there? That's the cerebral aqueduct. We're now up in the midbrain. Midbrain, um, this is just a little part of the brain. It's, it's, its name is kind of deceptive. People think it's going to be a really big area. It's not. The midbrain is actually a really tiny little area. It's basically right above the diencephalon. Um, but the midbrain is very important. It's got a lot of critical structures there. It has a lot to do with movement. Um, and we're going to see that in the brain physiology. So you can see the cerebral uh, aqueduct. And then notice the eyebrows of the monkey. All right. Those are the substantia nigra. Substantia nigra, literally the black stuff. That's what it means in Latin. Substantia nigra is important because it's neurons in the substantia nigra that in some people die mysteriously. Still to not really understood what's going on. But when those neurons die, they create a condition called Parkinson's disease. All right? So this is a big deal. We're going to come back to this again. So those are the eyebrows of the monkey. And then if you look in the area above the eyebrows, those are the cerebral peduncles. That's where the cerebrum is coming down and grabbing a hold of the brain stem, in particular the midbrain, which is right at the top of the brain stem. The eyes of the monkey are the red nucleus, all right? Red nucleus, um, named for its color, all right? In the same way substantia nigra is named for its color. Uh, red nucleus, a lot of iron. Substantia nigra, a lot of melanin. All right. So, red nucleus once again has a lot to do with controlling motor um, sorts of things. All right. And the reticular formation, uh, not really shown uh, very well here. The reticular formation is actually uh, just a whole bunch of fibers that extend from the brainstem up through the cerebrum. They're very important, and we're going to talk about them in brain physiology. There's no way to get a really good look at them. Here, all you're seeing is a little tiny cross-section. Imagine a big bunch of spaghetti that somebody cut through, and then you were to look down from the top on all those strands of spaghetti. That's what you're seeing. That's what they're showing as reticular formation. Really, the reticular formation is a whole bunch of strands of spaghetti that are running from the midbrain up through the cerebrum. Lots of stuff on this slide, and I really don't know even what all to talk about here. There's so many things. I'm just going to start looking at the diagram and talking. I'm not going to even try to keep um, in, in sequence with the stuff there. So try to just follow me. So notice the thalamus is purple. See, the thalamus is egg-shaped. It's very deceptive in these pictures because you can't really tell that it's egg-shaped. The thalamus is a big egg-shaped thing. Believe me, all right? I know I keep saying egg-shaped. Um, here it just looks like, you know, an oval. It's not. It's a big thing. And there's a thalamus on each side. There's a left and a right thalamus. Then, see there's the intermediate mass of the thalamus? That's a connector that connects the two halves, the left and the right thalamus. All right? And that's what runs through the middle of the third ventricle. That's why the third ventricle had a hole in it. Notice on top of the thalamus you see some choroid plexus. That's the choroid plexus of the third ventricle because the third ventricle is in between the two halves of the thalamus. Once again, it can be very difficult to try to take all these two-dimensional views of the brain and put them together into 3D, but that's kind of what you have to keep trying to do. Then notice up above the thalamus is a big, uh, thick, white band that's kind of a shape, you know, it's horseshoe sort of shaped, all right? That's the corpus callosum. Some people say corpus callosum. I don't care. Spell it correctly. 
Those are a whole bunch, like a few hundred million myelinated fibers that connect the left and the right halves of the cerebrum together. That's literally how people say, oh, the left side of my brain didn't know what the right side was doing. Well, if you caught that, then that'll be true. And in fact, we'll see there was a, a, an experimental surgery that was done that they don't do anymore because it caused some really weird side effects. Uh, they call it split brain surgery. Sounds like something from a sci-fi movie, a really bad sci-fi movie. But um, we'll talk more about that later. But that's the corpus callosum. Then notice it shows septum pellucidum. Once again, this is such a weird view. Remember, the septum pellucidum is the divider between the two lateral ventricles. So at the view we're looking at right now, one of the lateral ventricles would be coming out from the screen towards us. In fact, it would be blocking our view of a lot of the stuff that we're now able to see. That's why they've removed it. That's why we don't see it there. The other lateral ventricle would be back behind the corpus callosum. And that's why you're seeing the septum pellucidum. It's the little thin dividing strip between the two lateral ventricles. And uh, you'll just have to go back and look at the other pictures of the ventricles and try to put this together in your head. So notice down below that purple thalamus is that sort of dark bluish purple hypothalamus. It's hypo below the thalamus. It's also somewhat anterior. Hypothalamus, as we'll see, is pretty darn important. That's the homeostatic control center of the brain. Um, and we'll talk a lot about that. Then below that you see the optic chiasma, often just say optic chiasm. When the two optic nerves cross, the crossing is called a chiasm. So because in Greek the word chi is an X shape, those of you in the fraternity sorority thing know about the letter chi. It looks like an X. Well, what happens is, take your two index fingers and make an X with them. Make it so that your two knuckles overlap one another. Now imagine that you cut that X in half right down the middle all you would be able to see are where your knuckles are. And that's what we're seeing there where it says optic chiasma. You're just seeing where your knuckles are. It's really a big X and that's just the very middle of the X. Notice you see here the pituitary hanging down and then back behind it the mammillary body. You can see the medulla oblongata, the spinal cord. Now at the base of the corpus callosum on the front side, see where it says anterior commissure? That's really an extension of the corpus callosum. Once again, those are myelinated fibers that connect the two cerebral hemispheres. And on the back side of the corpus callosum, notice that you can also see labeled there is the posterior commissure. Same deal. Um, that's a bunch of fibers connecting the two together. Notice where the posterior commissure is. Right above it is the pineal right below it are the superior and inferior colliculi which they have labeled as the corpora quadrigemina that's the quadrigeminal bodies so that's a good reference point for the back side of the brain stem always remember they go in that order that'll help you on diagrams the pineals on the top then next comes the posterior commissure then come the two um, colliculi the two types of colliculi four all together making the quadrigeminal bodies. So um, I think that's a lot of what we hadn't talked about on this slide. A lot of the other stuff we have talked about before, so come back on your own again and use this when you're trying to do the labs. A lot of stuff labeled here, it'll probably help. And kind of the same thing here, just another view that had, you know, just sometimes one diagram has things a little better than another diagram. Again, all these things uh, we've talked about before, all right? Um, so just come back here and check these things out when you're doing the, uh, the labs. This diagram may help. Now this is kind of a throwaway slide. I just wanted to show you, see on the left you have the thalamus and on the right you have the hypothalamus. Um, at first, when you look at thalamus and hypothalamus, they just like, like, look like little chunks of brain, and you think, well, yeah, okay, that's just a bunch of brain tissue. Actually, they're highly differentiated structures. They have all these nuclei. So look at all the nuclei in the thalamus. They all do various different things, and the same in the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, as we'll see especially, controls things like hunger and thirst and aggression and so on and all those individual nuclei are involved in different of those things, okay? So, 
Um, I used to teach a neurophysiology class and the students actually had to know all the various um, nuclei of the thalamus and hypothalamus, but this is just bio 201. We don't do that here. You don't have to know those, all right? But I'm just showing you, see, I'm not making you learn everything there is out there. We're actually trying to keep it simple. I'm really heavily limiting what I make you learn. All right, so, um, yeah, basal ganglia. So basal ganglia uh, was the traditional name for them. Remember, a ganglion is a group of cell bodies outside the central nervous system. A nucleus is a group of cell bodies inside the central nervous system. For a variety of historical reasons, they were called the basal ganglia, but really, more appropriately, they are called the basal nuclei. You'll see both. You know, if in your career you talk to old people, they'll say basal ganglia. Talk to the people that came along after you, they'll all be saying basal nuclei. You were born at exactly the wrong period of time, because um, you'll have to know both terms in order to talk to the people, both older and younger. So, the basal ganglia, this is where, remember we talked about the, um, the substantia nigra down there in the midbrain? Neurons in the substantia nigra send their axons up here to the basal ganglia. And this is where basically Parkinson's is happening, all right? Um, the basal ganglia are uh, in control of things like posture and balance and um, unconscious movement. You know, like a, a fly lands on your cheek. You don't have to think, okay, now I'm going to scratch the fly. You just do it automatically, all right? So um, basal ganglia are uh, complex structures. They do a lot of different things. Again, they are central in Parkinson's disease. Um, there is the uh, caudate nucleus, the putamen, and there you see them uh, referenced with the lateral ventricle. This isn't a very good view, but the sagittal view, I just want you to kind of see a sense of where they are. Notice in particular here that you see the body of the caudate nucleus and then the tail. Look at what's going to happen when you start doing frontal or coronal sections of the brain. You're only going to see a little cross section. Same with the putamen. Notice the putamen is a big, uh, uh, and part of this, by the way, is also the globus pallidus, which you'll see in the next uh, slide. But these are structures that extend um, from front to back. They ex extend longitudinally in the brain. But when we do uh, coronal or frontal sections, we're only going to see little, little slices of them. Again, it's so hard with the brain, you have to take different views and put them together. So that's what we're going to look at next. And here we are. Here's a frontal or coronal section. So there you can see where the thalamus is, right? Okay. And there, by the way, there's the septum pellucidum, and you can see the two lateral ventricles. See? See what's going on? Those are the two lateral ventricles, the little divider, the septum pellucidum in between. You can see the third ventricle now down in between the two halves of the thalamus. And then, um, see, you can see putamen, and then you see globus pallidus. Um, so those form what's called the corpus striatum. Striatum means striped. It's the striped body. Corpus means body. So see how they form a little set of three on each side, a little a set of three stripes. The putamen is the outermost stripe, and then the globus pallidus, the inner stripe. All right. So all of those, this is all the basal ganglia again, all right? So, and then look at the caudate nucleus. All you see is that little dot for the caudate nucleus. Remember, it was that giant thing that wrapped around? Well, yeah, when you do a frontal section, all you see is a little tiny slice of it. That's why you have to kind of look at both views together to start to get a feel for the way this really looks. Now we can really see how the thalamus is two big egg-like structures, one on each side of the brain. Notice there also you see now the cerebral, uh, well, I guess they don't show those. Yeah, they do. They show the cerebral peduncles. It says the crust cerebri of the cerebral peduncles. So the cerebral peduncles, remember, is where the cerebrum connects to the brainstem. Then further down, notice on the pons off to the side, you see the cerebellar peduncles. That's where the cerebellum connects. Remember, cerebellum was opposite the pons. So that's where it connects. Remember, pons was the bridge between the brainstem and the cerebellum. Um, here you can see the pyramids as well. You can also see the optic chiasm. It's forming an X there that's kind of blocked a little bit. You can't see the whole X. There are the mammillary bodies again. So again, I know it's so confusing. You have to try to look at all these different views and put them together. So here we see a ventral view. 
let's look at a sagittal view, a left lateral view. So there you see the thalamus, all right? There you can see the cerebral peduncles wrapping around, all right? Um, you can see the two colliculi on the back, superior and inferior colliculus, all right? And uh, you can see now the cerebellar peduncles, where, see how the pons is gonna connect to the cerebellum there, at the cerebellar peduncles. You can see the two colliculi again, you can see the olives. Um, and the infundibulum is the little stem that the pituitary hangs off of the hypothalamus with. You know how an apple hangs off the tree with a little stem? Well, the infundibulum is the stem that allows the pituitary to hang off of the hypothalamus. And here now, um, another a dorsal view of the thalamus. Look around on the back, we see the pineal gland. That little bit of blue there in between the two thalami, that would be the septum pellucidum again, even though they don't label it. Here we see then the two superior colliculi, the two inferior colliculi. See the pineal there. See the cerebellar peduncles. All right, there's the medulla oblongata down at the bottom. And then now you can see the choroid plexus of the fourth ventricle. Fourth ventricle being in between the pons and the cerebellum. That would be where it is. So choroid plexus, again, where the ependymal cells are making cerebrospinal fluid. And looking here at some structures of the limbic system. Limbic system is not, um, unlike a lot of the other stuff we've been talking about, it's structures that are not all in the same place. They're connected by similar function. They all, um, they all send signals to each other. Limbic system, a very, uh, very ancient part of the brain. Um, it processes um, a lot of diverse things, including smells and memories and uh, emotions. And you might think, wait, what? Well, think about it. Have you ever been someplace and like, you know, you smell, you smell like cookies baking, and suddenly you're like back at grandma's house, you know, and it's Christmas time, and like all these memories and emotions just come flooding back with the smell? Or you know, you smell beans cooking on the stove, and suddenly you're at Nana's, and you know, your abuelo is playing with, you know, the little kids, and yeah, you know, smells and memories and emotions they're all they're all linked together you know certain perfumes you know i smell i'm walking through target i smell a certain perfume and suddenly i find myself thinking that green-eyed bitch you know smells the memories the emotions they come flooding back so you just gotta kind of sort through this on your own and find all those structures corpus callosum, anterior commissure, mammillary body, olfactory bulb the fornix i don't think i mentioned before and i should have you can see the corpus callosum. The fornix, the word fornix means arch. So see how it kind of arches down off of the corpus callosum, and then it's in between is the little septum pellucidum. That's the little membrane there. So the fornix is the arch that arches down um, below the um, corpus callosum there. Dentate gyrus, cingulate gyrus, you can cross those off. I won't ask you about those. And again, just a bunch of structures here, all in one diagram. Um, dentate gyrus, cross that off. Cingulate gyrus, you don't ever have to know that for me. Um, the one thing here that I didn't mention before is the hippocampus. Hippocampus, neat word, hippo, I don't know if you know this, a hippopotamus. Literally, hippo means horse, potamus is water. A hippopotamus is a water horse. And a hippocampus campus is basically the sea, the ocean. So what is a hippocampus? It's the seahorse. And uh, if you use your imagination, the hippocampus is kind of shaped like a little seahorse, all right? The hippocampus is a big damn deal because the hippocampus appears to be where memories are formed. Not necessarily where they're stored, it's where they're formed. Damage to the hippocampus can create some really weird things where people are conscious, they're alert, they're active, they remember everything that happened up to the point of the damage, but from the time of the injury on, they're unable to form any new memories. Like there's a really good movie called Memento, maybe you've seen that. And there's also a really bad movie called Fifty First Dates with Drew Barrymore and Adam Sandler. They always get that wrong. They, they, well, Memento is one of the only movies that has ever gotten amnesia right. Fifty First Dates gets it all screwed up. But bottom line is people in both of those movies 
were people who ostensibly had damage to the hippocampus. They were unable to form new memories. So that's some basic brain anatomy. Um, as you're doing your labs, just try to go back through these slides and see if they can help you identify the structures in the labs.